welcome to Kamea Radio. This is your hosts, David and Alex. Alex, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. How have you been? Doing pretty good. It's been a long week. I'm glad to finally be able to do our second episode. Yeah, finally, we, we're here. We're here. We're here. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Uh so, yeah. Uh, what it what uh before we get into nitty gritty and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, how how was your uh how was your week? T- tell us about how your week's been. My week's been lo- long. I worked the weekend. Uh needed Sunday and Monday to kind of recoup from that. But now I'm here. I'm ready to roll, and we're doing pretty good. I mean, how yeah, it, it's been good. Uh, definitely not as busy as you. You you got a whole different life than I do. But it's like. Just last week alone would have been last week. It would the week that Sparking Zero came out and Dima came out. I I put so much time into just content, whether oh, yeah. whether it be just live streams, putting up videos, uh, I prepping for the pod, uh, recording the pod and putting the first episode out. Like I was, I was really burnt out by the end of that first week. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure the editing and stuff is uh can be kind of tedious at times i think between all the sparking zero videos and the fusion i don't even think i did fusion world that whole week i think it was mostly just uh i think it was mostly just sparking zero and the pod but i think i put at least like six to eight hours of editing alone and so that was yeah i saw you pumping out videos there it was just it was a lot <laughs> it's a lot i didn't but i mean it was it was worth it i felt like i accomplished stuff and i definitely uh felt uh like i had the motivation to do it so i i yeah. can't i can't complain too much but yeah um so topics of discussion today uh obviously dima episode two came out so we're gonna talk yes, we're gonna talk about uh that in the second half of today's episode uh but i figured since we didn't really get a chance to talk about it uh, last time, I figured we could talk about uh, Fusion World and what's been going on with Fusion World. Oh, yes. A lot's been going on with Fusion World. I'm very excited. I'm already ready for the 15th. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was talking with... Uh, I was or I was talking with some people or and watching other people's content. Uh, specifically, I watched a video of uh, Phil Plays TCG and he, uh-huh. he put a video out about... Uh, about recently about the uh difference between like the, the dragon ball card game and like the one piece card game and stuff like that and he was he was saying how um a lot of it was more so just about like the popularity and like reasons as to why dragon ball might not the the dragon ball card game might not be exactly as uh, big as it probably should be but he yeah. he made mention in that video that like yeah like the set three meta like the meta itself feels great um outside of like maybe just a couple things that doesn't necessarily hurt the game in any way, but it's, uh, but like now it's also, at, we're all we're at like a time now where like we're a month away from set four and like it, the meta got extremely stagnant and, uh, you're kind of just running into the same things over and over again. Droids and Vegeta. I've actually never played one piece or never watched really thing on it. Like, yeah. Is it, is it the same as Fusion World? Like it plays the same, like uh, kind of the same rules. I I haven't played One Piece either. Um, from my understanding, it plays similarly to Fusion World. Um, yeah. Albeit, it's a obviously it's its own card game, and it does some things different here and there. But it it plays similar to Fusion World, from my understanding. Um. But yeah, I think. I mean, what's your thoughts on the meta right now? Like it's. Uh, it's just like how you say running into the same thing over and over again droids and vegeta and depending on like what deck you play that's kind of not meta maybe more a list it's okay like like when i play beers i'm a, i'm not that like okay i'm gonna lose automatically if i'm going up against a vegeta or droids but like typically if i'm running super saiyan 4 goku and then i'm running into a droids it's pretty much it you're you have a pretty hard uphill battle and i'd say majority of the time you're gonna lose unless they do not have a good hand at all yeah um yeah i i'd I'd say the same i mean i'm still trying to push for platinum on the client and i feel like every time that i get close to my placement matches like i'm either running into a droids deck or i'm running into a mirror match 
and they're just able to see, they're able to see their perfect curve and i just don't <laughs> and that usually kind of generate yeah. that that usually kind of just determines like how the match is just going to go um what well, i did beat a droids the other day with super saiyan 4 goku i was very surprised uh that he got his ramp off nicely but i don't i think he must have not i think he only pulled like one proly and i was able to just kind of lock that down and then i had luckily had two double strikes and and a bunch of cards and was able to out combo them so um, it ha you can do it it's just very hard yeah no and i mean it's like with like i ha i'm not the kind of person that like is like i i want to play them I like i like i want to play the meta like like vegeta's fun i enjoy playing vegeta but i'd rather be playing like other stuff like i've like i feel like i finally got a good grasp on bardock on the bardock black bardock deck and uh uh, I want to be able to play that more, but like, unfortunately, just the way that it kind of is is just droids and Vegeta are essentially the best decks right now. And like, if you want to progress in in the online client, like your your best bet is to run the best decks. And yeah, um, and yeah, like even like Vegeta, like I would say, I would say I think Vegeta is probably the best deck. And the only reason I would say that he is the best deck is just because he has the best matchup against droids. Mm -hmm. Um, where I feel like when it comes to Vegeta versus droids, it's probably like a 45 to 55 split in terms of winning. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just Vegeta is, I think is just better because it can beat droids. Whereas I think a lot of other decks tend to struggle against droids. Um, yeah, what? um, <laughs> maybe you're of the same, uh, same sentiment as me, but uh, what what are your what are your thoughts on like things like pilaf on the four cost ramp droids? Uh, in terms of like set three stuff, like do you think there's like a concerns anywhere with that? I think there was a concern for pilaf in set two, um, in my opinion. Ever since set in set one. two, wow, okay, set, set one, it's just, I, and I think a lot of it was overshadowed by the Broly meta in set one, because he, he was basically unbeatable. Um, and blue didn't really have a lot, a lot of support. I, I could have seen it being a problem from set one to two to three, and it's relevant now, especially with with the Vegeta deck. I, th I know Bandai doesn't like doesn't when they they don't errata anything, and they only limit things to one and not two, which kind of sucks. I mean, I think a P a two off peel off, a, a three off peel off would be fine. A Just three off, off. That's 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 a very different. Uh mindset from what a lot of the community is saying and i don't want it to be like to completely destroy the the card i mean it's a good card i think it's just limited it in a certain like in a certain amount of way would be better than yeah just have, man and, so you you think back in like set one like pilaf was actually a problem but just because broly existed it it wasn't yeah because every talked that about was a thing yeah, everyone complained about Broly in set one, and then set two came out. Everyone complained about top two, and kind of it went under the radar, I think, and and people were getting around it easily. But, um, wow, I mean, I don't know if I would agree with that necessarily, just because Blue was like the worst archetype in set yeah. one, um, and I think half of the reason why Blue even stood a chance in set one was because of Pilaf, um. Blue just didn't have the support really to put in a push towards other decks and stuff like that. No, uh, I agree with you. Uh, I... Set in set two. I mean, set two, blue got better, but I think blue was still probably like I'm trying to think back to like when I was doing breakdowns and stuff. Um, blue, I think, was still probably the worst archetype in set two, if not the worst archetype, maybe middle of the road. Like might have might have been third place, um, and like Pilaf was still kind of needed, I think, in set two. But like, yeah, like looking, I mean, it's it's one of those things where like, I think the writing was on the wall. Yeah, basically with with what I'm trying to get with Pilaf. Pilaf, I don't, I like, I didn't see it as a problem because of how much support it didn't have back then. But yeah, and give I give it the right cards, and it's going to be overpowered. Yeah, and I think. I had a conversation with someone earlier this week about that. And I think, I think the re I think the problem being is that 
uh, obviously we know that the digital client was meant to be for masters. Um, but due to technical difficulties from the dev team in terms of inputting the a lot of the card effects, like it became like a really hard task for them, supposedly. How oh, okay. hard how hard that task was supposed to be, or how hard that task was gonna be to be able to implement those effects, I have no idea. I'm not I'm not a game designer or a developer in any way. I can't speak for that team, but um, that's the whole reason why Fusion World even exists is because they still wanted to generate that client. They already have the resources from what they did for Masters in yeah. the game. So it was just a matter of um, it was just a matter of like transitioning that into something new. And I think that might be where I think Bandai probably fumbled the most was just due to the fact that because I mean, when, because it, we knew that at, I think at the beginning of last year was when the initial beta i think or summer it might have been summer of last year where the initial beta for the master's client came out and it was it had positive reception but then it wasn't then i think october hit i think it was october of last year and they came out and said that they couldn't implement the client because of that and so they were shifting to fusion world and creating a whole new card game specifically for the client did you um, get into the beta for that? I did not. I think I was visiting you when it happened. Oh. <laughs> look what you look what you did. I missed out on some history there. Um yeah, but I mean it yeah, so I mean I think what I think the fact that they had to like turn they had the shift face. They had to like they had to completely shift the design of a card game and create something completely new in order to get this out and they had to do this within a couple months. Um, so I think, I think Bandai kind of rushed things with Fusion World, and I think that's why a lot of these designs for some of these cards aren't as th well thought out as they probably could be, just because they needed to get product out. Um, and rather than just double and triple check for QA, I think they just, they just pushed out to, you know, try to get some of that, uh, Bandai money, you know, like it's so the only reason Fusion World was created is because creating a master client was too hard. That's yeah, not, that's, that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know if we could do this. Let's just uh, let's again, just... I, again, I'm not, I'm not a dev. I don't have any semblance or idea in terms of like what coding and game development's like. Um, but I mean, I've it. They could have easily just. They could have easily kept. The they still could have done both. I think they probably still could have had a, a, a masters and a fusion world client separately, because I mean you could still keep a lot of the bones of what the fusion world client's doing in the masters one. Yeah. Um, but what they probably could have done was they probably could have just started from set one of masters, and then just over the course of the game, kind of like what, kind of like uh, oh I don't want to say Yu Gi Oh Master Duel because Yu Gi Oh Master Duel they they had a lot of their product from the from the pa decades past like in the game yeah. um and it wasn't an issue for them like the, the, so i in terms they of how yeah they su surprisingly that was a really well-made client but um but yeah i mean they could have started with set one and they could have slowly worked their way up through all the sets um and then you know eventually it would have caught up they could have sped up process and whatnot eventually like some of the cards have a lot of similar effects you just copy and paste a lot of those effects over well, um, Fusion World, the way it's going, is going to end up being another Masters. So it's like the way they're going to have to code the game anyways is going to be how they would have had to. I'm, I'm skeptical about that new Secret Rare Vegito in the, in regards to the client. Because like oh. I, that card is 100% going... Like I feel like that card's going to have like a bug like day one. There's no way... But that's the one where you can like remove a card from your opponent's hand, right? No, that's so the the secret rare Vegito, the one where you don't lose even if you draw, you have no cards in your deck. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, yeah. He gains ten thousand power if you do, but then he's but then he switches to active once per turn. He bounces your opponent's card back to hand, and then you mill the top five cards of your deck. Like that's almost master's level of card text, um, in in itself. So I. I don't know. I don't. I feel a little skeptical in terms of like the client. If the, if there's going to be a bug for like a card like that, I can see it. Um, 
I mean, we're still we're still in the set three meta as of recording, and I mean, Boo's cape, Boo's model, his cape still like glitches <laughs> it's out. Still, it's still flapping out there. It's been two months since this, since set three <laughs> launched, and it's still bugging out. Uh, there's still that bug like in the game for the four cost Goku that freezes. Yeah. Like at, at the end of your turn, like you have to select them in order to like push forward. Like it's there's still bugs like in the game, so like. I, I can see there being like an oversight with like that secret rare in particular, just because of how much is going on with them. I think they fixed that one bug where when you put combo power in, it doesn't, it wouldn't show up. Unless yeah. You click on the card. That was, that, yeah, that was annoying in that set lost, two. That lost me a couple matches. <laughs> yeah. It's well, <laughs> just be good at math. That's, that's all you can, that's all you can really do. Um, yeah. So before, uh, before I guess we jump into Dima discussion, we got a couple minutes. We can still keep talking about Fusion World. Um, but uh, what what's your thoughts on set four so far? I'm gonna be playing UI Goku, regardless if it's meta or not, just because UI Goku is uh, he's the goat. So that's that's kind of where I'm at on that. Um, Beerus is gonna take a a step back for a little bit. For my, oh, red, man. my red decks, uh, still gonna probably play Super Saiyan for Goku because I'm loving black, and he's getting a lot of support in set yeah, four. He's getting a lot of support, yeah. Poor, poor Bardock. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, like, yeah, I mean, UI Goku looks like he'll be pretty good. Um, I feel like I feel, I feel like Bandai just like really gets off on like just making sure that red stays as relevant as possible because like I don't think there's been a single like bad red deck since the game launched. No, I don't think so. Like starter like you like set one starter coup was great. Um and U seven was kind of looked down on in set one and then it flip flopped in the set two in set two. Yep. Uh Beerus has always been relevant since set one. Yep. Uh Top Coup owned the meta in set two. Um until He's he kinda- until he got yeah. hit, but uh, he's definitely probably at the bottom of the red list now. <laughs> yeah, but he was he was still relevant like mm-hmm. when he came out. Uh, and then set three, Jiren, like he's missing some pieces, but he's still like a top contender. He's not definitely not the best deck, but he still can he can do some work. Um, that and, uh, that top for set four is going to be, I think, pretty good for Jiren. That the top card. Oh yeah. Oh, the topo. Sorry, Sorry, topo. No, it's topo. topo. It's not top. Top. The only the only character that's allowed to have one syllable in his name is hit. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. No. Uh, topo will be good for when when you're going up against your your a bad matchup for Jiren. Like Topo is going to be the answer. Um. Yeah. For you. Um. And I think that's honestly what Jiren just kind of needed. He needed something that gave you a semblance of control when you're playing him. Uh, Cause yeah. un- with like Jiren, w- J- Jiren's a great card and it's an auto include in the Jiren deck, like regardless of matchup. But um, you were always, it was always heavily dictated on what your opponent did. And mm-hmm. so, and like, so if you're, if you're, po- if you're, blah, 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 I can't speak. If your opponent, plays around you like you, you it just that's just a dead card that you played from hand like that's that's all that essentially did so yep. yeah topo will be good um the new secret rare i think is going to be an auto include in every red deck i don't think you you think four of i don't know if i would say four of because he's a zero combo cost in hand and i'm like thinking like beerus in, in like specifically um I think most times when either from seeing you play or having playing against Beerus players, I don't think Beerus players usually go higher than six energy. Um, no. So I would probably, I think if it was a matter where it was like Jiren and you could get up to eight energy, nine energy, I would say include multiple copies of the secret rare, but I think it might just be deck dependent. Honestly, um, I think like with Beerus, I think no more than two would be substantial would be fine um even in like jiren i think jiren probably wants to stick to two just because he already has so much zero combo stuff in his deck yeah. um 
really just kind of depends, but... Um, and the problem with, with beers, at least in my deck, is I run, I think, four Beeruses. So I already, and a couple of those three drop Goku, so I already have a lot of zero combo in my deck. So adding more with the cigarette, is, do some fiddle, fiddling around with the deck, but I, I don't think a four of would be good in Beerus, I agree. Yeah, so... Because, or in red. Now give... What, what, uh, now, given that secret rare, if you can have multiple on board, like, I don't think you're coming back from that. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's like that as soon as that card's played, like, that's like an immediate, like, focus option. Like, you either, yep. you either completely push your opponent to make sure and get them down to zero and just wipe them out in that instance, or you focus on that Goku to get them off board. Cause mm -hmm. having two 40k swingers that minuses everything on board by 20 when attacking is that's, that's scary. That's yeah. really scary. And add that with the uh, three drop. Was it three drop Gohan? The ten, the minus ten to everything. Oh yeah, yeah. Like if you can keep that secret rare on the board for a turn. Yeah, keep it on board. Like my, even minus thing thirty. Like pretty pretty much wipes out the majority of the game. Yeah, it's. Yep. That's scary. What were you gonna say before I jumped in there? Oh no, you. Uh, I was curious on what leader you're looking forward to next set. Um. UI Goku, I think, will be good, but I feel I have a feeling like all, all, everyone's going to be playing them. Um, I want to like the Gohan, but the weird thing with like the Bandai reveals so far for Sephora has been really weird because like we we've not seen everything. We've seen like twenty percent of what the set is before yeah. they got into like the alt arts, and so that Gohan in blue is very dependent. Like his whole leader skill is based off of playing extra cards for cheaper, mm -hmm. uh, but they need to be earthling and Saiyan. And we've only got one card that that can proc. So mm -hmm. in terms of viability for that deck, I don't know because there's not a whole lot of support for that leader effect. Um, Green Vegeta. I'm actually very excited for. Um, I, I've gotten so tired of the of green's whole gimmick being oh we got to ramp to eight and then just drop our bombs um it was fine for like the first couple sets but like uh, with like piccolo last set it was like okay i still have to get to eight but like i need to play the, play him differently and, yeah. um, and unfortunately piccolo just wasn't it um piccolo just wasn't it he didn't get the support that he needed to really like stand out um, but with Vegeta, it's different because he's a low end deck. So he's like every yeah. e he's like every other deck in the game. Yeah. Um, and but like it's but he's heavily restricted. You can, you don't want to go above six energy with with that Vegeta. So it's a very different play style. But it seems like he's getting a lot of strong support to be able to warrant that effect or that type mm -hmm. of play style. So I think Vegeta could be really good. Um, Super Boo, I think, is the exactly what Yellow needed. Um, a very heavy, aggressive deck that's able to mm -hmm. swing big and swing wide. Um, and especially since, like, Yellow, like, Yellow has always struggled with, re like, removal. Like, every other deck has removal of some type. And, like, Yellow only just got some stuff in, in the last set, but it, it's still not enough against the, the current meta so mm -hmm. if yellow can just get some options that allows him to play high and wide at the same time which is kind of what he's kind of doing anyway mm -hmm. um i think like I, I just think he i think that's probably going to be i think boo, i see i think super boo is going to be the best deck with probably ui goku behind him and maybe baby as third um yeah I'm liking how babies look, and it's different. I don't, I didn't know, I don't know if in Masters you could do. There was cards where you could uh, combo rested there, battle cards. There was, I think, I think they pulled it from Masters. I mm -hmm. think there was a baby deck that did utilize stuff in rest mode. So, um, oh, so it's a copy and paste. <laughs> I, I'm probably not necessarily uh, strictly a copy and paste, but I mean, obviously, they have, obviously, they have to. Ink in a game like this, especially in its infancy, they have to introduce like new gimmicks and mechanics all the time early on to kind of keep things fresh. Eventually it's going, eventually that uniqueness is going to fizzle out over time. Um, 
But I mean, that's I think that's probably the best thing that about having Masters and Fusion World is just that they're able to pull from Masters and utilize st- and utilize like those those effects as like a stepping stone to like create new stuff in Fusion World. Yeah. Um, which I think is fine. Yeah, I think Baby will be interesting. Um, from what we've seen so far, Baby also looks really good too. Um, just being able to play like rest mode stuff is good in and of itself. And it has, it has to be machine mutant, right? In order to do that, or is it, uh, or I think or it's, bra- I think, it, I think it's brainwashed and machine mutant. Okay. Um, so, but we, again, we've only seen like 20% of the game and like 4% of that is baby. So, yeah. uh, we'll have to see what the support is for a lot of these decks, honestly, um, in order to really like gauge how good they're going to be. But just off of, the SRs and uh, some of the rares. I think that's where I kind of stand with it. I, me personally, I think I'm more excited for Baby than anything else. But yeah. So yeah, uh, but that's Fusion World. Uh, I mean, we'll we'll f- I, I we should be getting the full card set, or the the full list within the next like week or two. So yeah, it's closing in. So we'll have we'll have more to talk about like once like that actually like reveals itself, but. Um, I think, uh, I think we can jump in towards, uh, episode two of Dima. Yeah, let's do it. What'd you think of that opening? Uh, so I like the opening. Um, I'm a little, I, I, I kind of want to hear what it sounds like in the, in the dub. Mm-hmm. Like when, when they, when they do, when they dub the, uh, cause sometimes, sometimes the Japanese opening is just better than what the dub opening is. Um, like with except the, for, except what? Except in a super tournament of power, the English dub was way better. Yeah, that I, I was gonna say. I was gonna say just that was like I actually, like, yeah, that that opening for the tournament of power opening was. I it was great on both, but I definitely like the like they did that they did the English version like really well. Yeah, for that, so like I was fine with that. Um, but yeah, I want to see what that is. It was. The the lyrics itself in the Japanese version like seem like they're gonna be a little cringy in English, so I might prefer <laughs> I I might prefer I might prefer the the Japanese one. Um but I'm the chorus is really catchy. I like I like yeah. the chorus of the song. Um definitely feels Dragon Ball y and that did you know that the opening is actually I don't know if you know who Zed is. Zed, it sounds familiar. Oh my gosh. He's a uh, he's a EDM artist. Like TS, no. like Tiesto and uh, Calvin Harris and all those other ones. He's from, he's from Germany, but he's uh, he actually got to coll- he he collaborated with that song. Like that's that's his oh, okay. that's his song. So I think it's actually kind of cool that they got then they not only got a someone that outside of Japan to like collab with on that opening, but it's somebody who actually is like a big Dragon Ball fan too. So. No. Yeah, I was thinking of Zeb from Star Wars Rebels. <laughs> <laughs> I was not thinking of that. Get her a pass. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I mean, the opening was cool. Um, there's a couple little things that they like kind of showed us, and there's more context in terms of like the overall like wor- like world building and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, like we know now that there's three Dragon Balls in the Demon Realm. Yep. And it's strict, and it was strictly with the. Tamagami is that is that what they were called? I, I think that's I think that's correct. Um, They're the ones guarding the Demon Realm Dragon Ball. Yeah, um, I wasn't sure how many of their them were gonna be there, but I guess like yeah, there is just three. Like I thought, I figured there was there was the possibility that there'd be more, but I mean three is fine. It's different from the other Dragon Balls. The Cerulean Dragon Balls is only two. Yep, and they're the size of marbles. <laughs> Uh, these ones seem like they're going to be bigger than like the earth dragon balls, but they just by the design of the characters and like how big they are, it seems like they might be a little bigger than the earth dragon balls, but smaller than the Namekian dragon balls. Uh, huh. um, we'll have to see. And then, uh, the other takeaway that I got from it, and you can let me know what you took from it, but, uh, we saw what, uh, Deborah's father looks like. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, Abara. And by the way, more Toriyama naming convention. <laughs> Abara Kadabara. 
like just uh, i i got a chuckle when i when i put two and two together there i was like i was like wow <laughs> awesome <laughs> i love this it seems to be like most things like in pokemon like you get abra alakazam yep abra kadabra like, alakazam yeah that was yeah. typical name you got yeah you got you gotta you gotta stick with the like if if I didn't get names like this, like or in naming conventions like this in Dragon Ball going forward, like I think I'd probably be a little sad inside. But <laughs> what did you think? I liked the. I don't know what that stood out to me the most was during the opening, like Vegeta and Goku were fighting this one thing, and then all of a sudden they start fighting each other. <laughs> did you notice that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a. Uh, I thought it was very. I I liked the. I liked the opening. I thought the music was was really was pretty good it was it had kind of like a uh, uplifting kind of but still heavy kind of tone to it which i thought was interesting and and, and pretty cool and, and a little different because yeah. usually dragon ball openings are very high energy boom boom yeah. boom it's just yeah <laughs> but it's kind of like brought it down a notch but also kept the same type of spirit um the one big takeaway that i took from the opening too was their uh their ode to Akira Toriyama in it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um you you might know what I'm talking about, but the uh like part of the Japanese lyrics for Dragon Ball Daima, um I have it pulled up on I have it pulled up on Twitter, but I don't know like what the actual like Japanese kanji is. Um but in one one line of the lyrics, um in English, it translates to "dreams are endless, never give up," which, which for a show like Dragon Ball is like that's basically synonymous with Dragon Ball. Um, yeah. But in, in the midst of, in the midst of the Japanese kanji for that, uh, for those lyrics, they put Toriyama's name in the lyrics. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did. I did see that online somewhere that they did that. I thought that was really cool. And that was really that was really cool for them to do that. Um, very appreciated. I think. I think if any big Dragon Ball fan would would, if they saw that, that they would probably just light up just by seeing that. And it's not even the first. We'll get into it later. But it's not even the first like ode to Akira Toriyama either, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was which is which is just nice that they're really like honoring the man that you know brought the show this show this show specifically, but the franchise itself to light, which I think was pretty mm -hmm. cool. Uh, so let's get into the I guess the episode. So. Uh, we cut, we cut into the aftermath of what the wish was, mm -hmm. um, which was basically making everybody young again. Um, we cut to the gang all realizing that they're all small and not realizing what's happening. Um, we get into the opener and then we cut back to, uh, Degesu, uh, Neku and, uh, and uh, Goma back on the lookout. Um, and there was a mention of, there was a mention by Shenron that, uh, and there's been a lot of talking points about this too within the community, but there was a mention of Shenron that like, because they were first time, you they, they asked like, yeah, they wish. were, they were like, oh, we only got one wish. I thought that we got three. And they were like, oh, well, you guys are first timers. So you guys only get the one wish. Um, and I didn't think anything of it at first, but then like, I saw like a lot of the community talking and they're like, oh, well that, well like that, that 100% explains why like Chi Lai in the Broly movie only got the one wish. And, uh, cause she was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, like she should, she would have gotten, you know, three wishes, but yeah, she only had the one wish. And then that would also explain why. In like the Resurrection F movie, um, you had um, crap. What what was Frieza's sorbet? Sorbet made the wish on the dragon uh, to bring Frieza back, but Pilaf and the gang were in the background when they made yeah. that wish. So that's why they were able to get multiple wishes. Um, it shows that Shinron does have favorites. Kind of, yeah. He he does have me. Like I know there was a lot of people talking, like like oh no, he. What if he was just protecting? What if he was just protecting himself and the Z fighters? Like, and I I didn't I wasn't one to like give into that idea because like I I think Shenron is pretty bipartisan. I don't think he, yeah. I don't think he has because like if that were the case, if that were the case, like he'd be able to sense the evil intent of Demon King Piccolo and Dragon Ball. 
Yeah, and he probably wouldn't turn to the kids anyways. But yeah. Like, oh, uh, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, like he he's pretty he's pretty unbiased, I think. It's uh and so I think I don't think that applies, but like yeah, so I I thought that was a cool de- le- uh, level of detail. Um so after that they decided they they were going to go over and I I guess to solidify that the Z warriors can't do anything against him. They decide to kidnap Dende who, by the way, is like adorable as a, as a baby. <laughs> He's a little too cute. A little Namekian baby. You know, a uh, little, little baby. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they decide to kidnap Dende and take him with them to the demon realm. So that way, like they can't like, I guess, lash back at him. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, Mr. Popo has horns. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Didn't see that one coming. Uh, I think this is the most we've ever learned about Mr. Mr. Popo <laughs> in like the entirety of <laughs> in like the entirety of the of Dragon Ball. Uh, so I mean the horns, I he has the pointy ears. So like there's always the possibility that he too is from the demon realm, but yeah. like the horns make it seem like he's from Otherworld, like kind of like the ogres in Otherworld, like in Hiffel. Yeah, yeah, and stuff. Um. Which, which honestly, considering how strong they made him look in like dra- in OG Dragon Ball, like that that doesn't surprise me now because he is like if he is from Otherworld or is like an appointed by Otherworld to be Kami's like right hand mm-hmm. would make sense why he would be as strong as he was at that time period. So, um, I like how they mentioned that Goma was a, a Majin. Yeah, and, and yeah. That was. That, uh, I, I think it was kind of mentioned in episode one that like. I I don't know if it was. I I, I they mentioned the Majin. I don't, they didn't say he was one. I mean, I I mean Majin is what Majin and like what in Jap in Japan Japanese is demon right? I think so. I'm trying. I'm looking it up right now. The word Majin has no direct translation, but it generally means one who has supernatural ability. Uh, the characters in the word individually uh, translate to demon, demonic, devil, or magical. And then mm. ma- that's Ma, and then Jin is person. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I thought I thought in the first I thought in the first episode like uh, the race of Majin wasn't like strictly relating to like Majin Buu, but like just people from like people that originate from the demon realm. But maybe yeah. maybe I'm maybe I'm misremembering. Because if that was the case, Namekians would be Majin and Shin would be Majin. By by technicality, sure. If if that is applied that way, um. But yeah, I mean, you could it could be it could be certain races, maybe certain races are because I mean, the the because like the Supreme Kai's and like the Namekians and stuff that that's just the name convention that we know of them as. Because they were introduced first before all of this. So yeah. like now that we have the greater context, if the if Majin is strictly referring to a race that originates from the demon realm, then you could surmise that every single one of those races are technically Majin, even mm-hmm. if they don't refer to themselves as such now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's that it, it, well, it is interesting. Um, I guess it's one of those things we'll find out. We'll get more context on as we kind of go in, but yeah, um, just kind of is what it is. Um, so then, after, yeah, so they kidnap Dende, they go back to the Demon Realm, and then we cut back to everybody at Capsule Corp. Um, there was a lot of just discussion about what was kind of going on. I know, like, Chi-Chi and Bulma were talking about how youthful they look and how young they, they are. Um, I, I, I like the joke from uh, from Vegeta to, to Hercule. <laughs> he's just like, who? He's just like, who are you? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Like even like despite the fact that like like all that they did in the fight with Majin Buu, like they still <laughs> he's still treated like he's like he's like second hand. <laughs> Which is just funny to me. I think my favorite character out of that was uh, probably Master Roshi. Oh yeah. 
Because <laughs> <That's, laughs> we've, nev we've never seen him younger than that. No, he's always just been the old guy. But he's still he's still the same Roshi. <laughs> <He's> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there like a line in there like he was saying how like uh, like he was like people called him Kami Senen, which which was like which like translate to like like old old like old turtle or something like that. But now he was yeah. like saying that people should call him Daddy Turtle or something. <laughs> <Daddy> turtle. <laughs> I forget what the I forget what the line was, but then he like turned. But like after he said that, he turned around and he like he like winked at the baristas. <laughs> he was still he was still like the flirtatious old man despite his youth. Yeah. But like it's weird because it's like. It's weird because it's like they're all they were all turned to children, but like uh they were all turned to children, but like he was still like taller than everybody else. Mr. Satan was taller than everybody else. Yep. Uh Vegeta is still like shorter than Piccolo because they had that side by side. <laughs> um and I'm just like, man, like <laughs> Vegeta's not beating the height the height allegations at no, all. He's, he's uh he's forever gonna the receding hairline. He'll forever be our short prince. Um <laughs> Uh, the one thing, the one thing from that scene I took away from was uh, outside of Master Roshi, who looked way too closely to Krillin, and I kept getting confused. Uh, was uh, Baby Goten and Trunks? Um, yeah, yeah. We we mentioned it, we mentioned it last episode, but I mentioned how like me, like how in Superhero we saw them older than they've ever been, and now this is the youngest that they've ever been mm -hmm. on on screen. Um, well, Trunks has been about the same. Oh yeah, think. we did see Trunks as a baby. You're right. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't see Goten baby though. Yeah, that yeah, that's that's fair. Um but like they but like I know I saw a lot of people talking like like how they were like talking in telepathy. And I don't know if people realize that like telepathy has like always kind of been a thing in Dragon yeah. Ball. Um like I specifically always think back to like the Namek saga when Goku arrives on Namek and he like he like speeds all the way to Krillin and he's like he's like let me see what's been going on and he puts his he puts his hand on Krillin's bald ass head uh, yeah, <laughs> and he, he, and he yeah. like reads his mind and then he gets like a whole grasp of it. Like, like, I mean, telepathy. And then I think, I think there's been like scenes with like master Roshi and stuff doing telepathy too, but well, and super when they were looking for like people to, to join the tournament of power, or whatever with Goku and Gohan did that simulation fight for, to see if Krillin would have been viable option. Oh yeah. Like, like telepathy fake fight. Oh, the, um, the image training, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's all. That's a form of telepathy, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's always kind of been there. But I don't know if I don't know if I, I don't know if I believe that it's telepathy. And maybe maybe you thought differently of the scene, but like I, the way I saw that between Go Ten and Trunks was that, um, there's been like studies and stuff that studies and that like babies like when they communicate like they actually know what they're talking about like it's their own like babble talk is like its own universal language uh -huh. um so like like because like when they because the whole time that like the whole time they were talking they were like cooing and babbling and stuff like in the background as like their as like their actual like voices were like being projected on screen and so i thought that they were just talking in babble talk and they were understanding what they were saying, and we were just giving context to what that conversation was. Yeah, I, I, I could see both ways. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, they're still babies, and they were they were pretty adorable as babies too. Like it's just, but, but they were they were taking it so nonchalantly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were sitting there, and they were they were sitting talking about like, oh, this feels weird, it's like being like we're we're being made to babies, and then they start just play wrestling. <laughs> it's like. Well, and it's like they have their they have their mind from like their nine year old mind, eight year old minds in the baby, so they're just babble talking. They 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 literally committed to the bit. They're like <laughs> they committed to the bit. I'm like, oh, we're babies, so we're just gonna be like, we're gonna act like babies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that yeah, they it's very GT because like they make met they made mention of how like all the characters like they're uh, like. I think it happened after like Bulma and Chi Chi were talking about like how young they they looked and stuff, mm -hmm. but they were like, but it was like no, like you're you're all children, we all have the bodies of children, but like we're still, like we're still of the same like mindset and minds that we were when we were adults. Yeah. Um. And so that was very like GT in that in that sense because that's what that's what kind of happened to Goku and GT. Yeah. Um. So I can I could definitely see like the allusion to it. 
like at this point like now now that it's been confirmed that like no they're not just kids they're they just got turned into kids it makes mm-hmm. sense um yeah so then they fa- so yeah they decide like oh let's go talk to dende let's go talk to everybody at the lookout and try to get context of what happened they go to the lookout and they find out that dende's been kidnapped um, they find out who kidnapped them, and they mentioned uh, they mentioned Go- Goma and Degesu and uh, Neku or Neva. Neva is his name, not Neku. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Piccolo, yeah. And then Piccolo makes this weird comment that like he knows who Neva is. Yeah. Um, what are your? Where do you think that comes from? I have my thoughts, but I'm curious what you think. Well. I know Piccolo said he wasn't old enough to con- to be, I guess, in the demon realm or know anyone in there because I think uh, I can't remember who made the comment about, hey, do you know him or something like that? He's like, or was I there? He's like, no, I was too young. Um, I have a feeling that that guy probably he's like his he's passed down from like generation to generation of who this guy like he's very famous Namekian that so I'm guessing through his time growing up people have probably heard about him at some point so i have my own thought and let me you tell me what you think um so i don't think it's something that neither i don't think it's something that neither piccolo nor kami would have known about because from og dragon ball like we we know from we like we we know what his origins are in terms of OG Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. Mm-hmm. Um, like they used Piccolo and Kami used to be one, one being that arrived on earth to escape the cataclysm of Namek. Um, but they were really young. So they, and they lived on earth for wh- however many years that they lived on. And then, but that nameless Namekian like split, uh, split up to remove the corruption that was brewing in his heart after seeing like the things that humanity was doing. Yeah. Um, and then he became two separate entities, which was Kami and then Demon King Piccolo. Um, so I don't think at any, like, and at that point, like they had no, at that point, they had no like earthly idea in terms of where they were from. I don't know if that was a consequence of the split. I don't know if like, he just didn't know like w- about old Namek. Mm-hmm. And what old Namek and stuff before the cataclysm, like before he got sent to Earth. I don't know if he was just too young to remember that time. Um, but based off what we know of Kami and Piccolo alone, I don't think that they would have known. However, there is a possibility that he would know that from uh, Nail. Because, because of because of the grand elder on Namek. Yeah. The grand yeah. elder is an old ass dude. We don't and he's the only, one of the few surviving members of that cataclysm from back in the day. So at least in terms of Z, he might have been the only remaining person that survived the cataclysm from. Yeah. So as old as he is, he would know like he would know about the demon realm. He would probably know about Neva and nail being his appointed, like bodyguard would have probably heard stories from grand elder guru about the demon realm and Neva and all that. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking it it comes from Neva. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately it's not explained to us in any way in this episode. Um, Piccolo just see, uh, just seems to have this information, um, but I think I I think we could probably pin it to that. It's not the first time Piccolo's had that kind of information about things. Yeah, uh, I can't. Oh, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on it, but there was something that Kami knew specifically that Piccolo didn't know. But I think he's like, oh, since being infused with Kami, like he knows this now, like. Yeah, like he, yeah, Piccolo has like all this knowledge because he has like two other beings like within himself 
Um, I think a lot of people forget about Nail too. Like people kind of focus more on like, oh, it's Kami and Piccolo, but people forget Nail's in there too. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's sad because like, yeah, I mean, Nail was like kind of like a nobody in ter- like he was one of the stronger Namekians on Namek at the time, but, mm-hmm. um, but he was kind of like treated as like a nobody character, uh, just just to kind of be there to facilitate Piccolo's growth. Yeah. Um, and I think if that if my theory pans the way that I think it's going to pan. I think it's fine. I think it's fine that he uh like if 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 Nail is given this much more like pre- uh like presence because of like little information like this, I think that's great personally. Mm-hmm. Um it just makes him more of more of an important character than people I think make him out to be. Um so yeah, they learn from about they learn about Neva Shin learns about his brother. Goku learns that Shin has a brother, and he's surprised by that. Um, and so Shin goes off to his Shin, like they talk about wanting to go to the demon realm to go save Dende. Um, and then Shin goes to the planet of the Kais and comes back with one of those ships that they transported on. Yeah. Um, however, it's completely out of repair. So they call on Bulma up to the ship to see if she can fix it. And I think it's really funny that like every time that like they need Bulma to fix a ship, like it's old, decrepit, mossy, <laughs> like it's been sitting forever. Um, and like every single time, like Bulma is like able to like get it up and run it, running again, just goes to show how smart of a character, how smart Bulma actually is mm-hmm. that she can just see this alien technology and is like, Oh yeah, I can fix this in five days. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Yeah, so while she's up there tweaking on the ship and stuff like that, uh, Goku and the gang are having issues with controlling their key because their bodies are now different. Yeah, Um, can't can't get used to lighter weight. I love, I love that joke. I love that joke where like Goku almost falls off the lookout, and he's like, "It's harder than I thought." And like Piccolo like teases him, is like, he's like, "Oh, you can't even control your own key." (laughs) And Goku's like, "Well, while you try it," and Piccolo, he's like, "I will," and he flies off and he starts flying away. (laughs) That's a good one. Yeah. Um. So they so they're so while Bulma's working on the ship, Goku and everybody is like trying to get used to their bodies. Um and they kind of get a hang on the flying aspect of it, but Goku realizes that the it's funny, like Goku's like, huh? He's like, I can't he's like, I can't he's like, I can't hit this beam as easily as I could before. Like, I don't get it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. like it's like he like he knows he's smaller and he knows that like he, like his body is out of balance. Like, how do you not recognize that? Like, yeah, yeah your limbs are shorter too. Um, I guess they needed an excuse to bring the power pole in there. Yeah, that's kind of what they did. Well, and I love that callback. I love that. Like, and I think, yeah, in that moment, you can maybe, you can maybe like see, see like, oh, it's Super Goku. Like, it's basically just Super Goku and how mm-hmm. dumb Super Goku's portrayed. Um, in in an extent, but I think this also is a great example of like how smart like Goku actually is when it comes to combat, because Mm -hmm. like he realized that he was at a disadvantage because he lost his reach, even though it took him a while to figure out why he couldn't reach certain things. Uh, but he had the thought of getting the power pole, which is a fantastic idea because that helped him so much as a kid, but he didn't really have that context in OG Dragon Ball. No. Like, yeah, like Goku was as successful of a fighter as he was because the power pole helped to extend his reach. And he never really made that. I don't think he ever really made that distinction as a kid. But like now that he's a a experienced fighter Mm -hmm. and he's had all these like experience experiences and battles, um, like now he can kind of connect the two that like, yeah, the power pole, like it will extend my reach in combat. It'll help me out. So I think that's really smart of him. Um, to kind of have that revelation, uh, so he goes to see Corin, and it's the first time we see Corin in forever, and it was it was very nice. I enjoyed it, um, but no Yajirobe. Yeah, where is he? <laughs> like I, I was excited to see like a, but would would Yajirobe have been affected by that wish too? He wasn't at the party, so was he? Because the wish was specifically for everyone who was involved in what the Maj and Boo. Yeah, so, so I don't know what. Part he played, I don't think he played any part in the Majin Buu saga or any type of relevance at least outside of Sensu Beans. But yeah, he w- he wasn't shown on screen in any way. No. Um, 
So unless like there unless like there was like a scene from like when Super Boo was like turning all the Z Warriors into candy and eating them, like unless he was like in that, but well, that would have been cool to see a baby Yajirobe with a little baby katana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just sitting there, and he's just like, "What are you looking at?" <laughs> <laughs> Duff, <a> little snack. <laughs> you know who else got turned into a small child? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, and, and that's an interesting thought experiment because Gohan wasn't at the party either, but he was involved in, he yeah. was involved in the Boo saga. So, like, was Gohan transformed too? Was he not? Are we even gonna see Gohan? I have no Is idea. Like, well, <laughs> I don't think we will. Would be yeah, he's he's too busy at a conference. Yeah, <laughs> studying, studying. Um, but yeah, I mean that's an interesting thought. Like, I wonder if Yajirobe did change or not. It would did Yajirobe change into a child? Did Gohan change into a child? I just I can't imagine what people would think if Gohan did get turned into a child and he was studying, like, and he just turned into a child randomly in class, <laughs> like what people would be thinking about. Uh, so, well, yeah. God, it'd be kind of weird because with the original voice actress for Kid Goku and Go, like that's subsequently Kid Gohan. Is coming back. So, like, if you had Gohan and Goku, it'd be the same voice. That's true. Um, unless they decided to, unless they decided to get the current voice actress for Kid Gohan to voice yeah. Gohan as a child. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, because I think they would have to make that distinction in the dub. So, mm -hmm. although otherwise, I think everyone would just be confused. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. So, yeah, he goes to Korin's Tower thinking that the power pole is still at the top of Korin's Tower. It's not there. So he says that Master Roshi came and picked it up a while ago. <laughs> um, so he flies to Master Roshi's and he asks Master Roshi where it's at, but they have no idea where it's at. And there's a funny scene where Turtle is like hearing the conversation and he's freaking out because, because Master Roshi is using it to dry laundry. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is not yeah, the... I mean, it's, it's not it's not the first time he's done something like that. I, I remember he did that with the Boncho fan, I think, in the OG Dragon Ball. I mean, it's, at least it's getting used. Yeah. Right? I mean, at least it's at least it's not destroying the power pole like he did with yeah. the Boncho fan. Like the Boncho fan, I think he was like, oh, I thought it was a hot plate. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like it was like a cooling pad for a hot plate. And like he burnt the Boncho fan. So like he, that's why he had to go to to like cool down the, the Inferno at Ox King's Tower. Uh-huh. In OG Dragon Ball, so um, at least he took better care of it. But so yeah, he gets the power pole. He comes back. He comes back, and then they all have dinner, and they're having a discussion uh, about the demon realm, what it's like. Uh, Piccolo talks about how uh, he talks about how Namekians uh, lived in a really nice area, like a, a yeah. nice place within the demon realm. Um, and the only reason that they left is because like Namekians don't like to be ruled. Um, so that kind of leads into like the theory that we were talking about last episode, where, mm -hmm. uh, where like we were saying that like maybe there was some like, uh, there was like some uprising from people, uh, against like the Majin or in, in there, or there's like a, some grand, uh, insurrection, uh, from the Majin, and it started like, uh, maybe maybe it started putting all of the other races in the demon realm into, uh almost like in like indentured servitude and stuff like that. Yeah. Um and that's why a lot of a lot of these races kind of left the demon realm. Um but it could also be something just like oh like like Namekians are too proud to have rulers so we just left. <laughs> like it could be something simple, it could be something grand, but I I I can see it being either either or just because of the history of Dragon Ball like they're not good. sometimes they don't make things as lavish as people would want them to be like it's just that simple yeah. like they just wanted to leave yeah so i don't know uh was there anything else i'm i'm kind of i kind of glanced over the dinner itself but like was there anything else that stood out in that conversation that you can think of um top of my head no basically that people who left the demon world like they left in troves and then eventually 
it was forbidden to leave and you had to have basically special permission to leave. But I think that kind of goes back to why, like who was ruling kind of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, cause why else would they, why else would they sanction travel outside of the demon realm? If it wasn't, yeah. if it wasn't for some sort of like grand takeover from the like demon King Piccolo, mm -hmm. not demon King Piccolo, uh, Deborah and his father and Goma and all them. So mm -hmm. I think, I think, I still think we're kind of on the nose with with that, but that'll come in due time. Yeah. Um, and then we're introduced to Glory Hole. I mean, Glorio. Uh, <laughs> Glory Hole. <laughs> um, no, we're introduced to Glorio, uh, which we we didn't talk about last episode, but he was there in the first episode. Yeah, he was like in the shadows. Yeah, he was kind of hanging out behind like a pillar, like listening in on Goma and Degesu's conversation. Um, he shows up. And everyone thinks that, oh, they're coming back for more. They're coming back for more, but they don't they don't feel like any like like negative intent yeah. off of him. Like he's not giving off like a bad vibe. He shows up and he he comes specifically for Goku. He knows Goku by name, um, which is interesting because. Because if he says that he he what he was asked by the. There's like there's like a they alluded in the conversation they alluded to multiple rulers within the demon realm, which means there's different yeah. realms within the demon realm. Mm -hmm. Um kind of like kind of like uh Anglo Saxon Britain back in the day was kinda like they there were multiple rulers like that yeah. ruled over England at a time. Um Game of, Game of Thrones in the Demon Realm. Yeah. So it's so like it's kinda alludes to that. Um but he mentioned that, that the the king of the third demon world asked for Goku specifically. He asked for him to go and get Goku specifically. But looking back on the last episode, um, Goma and them, I don't think know what any of the, uh, any of their names. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like there was audio in that, in the recap, the recaps yeah. that they were watching. So I'm curious as to how they know Goku by name. It's a good point. Um, I, I have no idea. Um, the only thing that I can really think of off the top of my head would be. This might be outlandish to think, but what if like. What if like, because we know that we know there's multiple races in the universes that originate yeah. from the demon realm, just based off the fact that they have pointy ears. So we know that the Yardradians. Uh, both different versions of the Yardradians are from mm -hmm. the demon realm. Mm -hmm. So what if, what what if one of the people from Yardrat went back to the demon realm for whatever reason, and they know and they see like all the stuff that's happening in the demon realm, and mm -hmm. they mention and they mention Goku by name because I would imagine the the, the Yardradians would have an idea. Of what of like Goku's adventures, like he was there for a long time to learn, yeah. to like learn and train. So I would imagine Goku would have shared stories about like his exploits and and kind of they would have that's an idea. They'd have to have an idea. That's an interesting thought, but I've kind of hope for more. But yeah, like I don't like I I just I can't think of anything else off the top of my yeah. head as to how they would know. Because I'm the, the I don't think the Namekians are going back. They have no reason to. Um. The Kai's like none of the Kai's that we that we are aware of went back at any point, mm -hmm. until now. So like, the the only that's the only thing that makes sense to me would be that, like the Yardradians for some reason would still have connections, and somebody went back and told them kind of like, hey, this guy's a like. Yeah. And and this and we could all we, we could also be overthinking it too. It could it could be that maybe maybe Goma didn't pay for sound for his TVs. And the third Demon <laughs> World King has has yeah, a built-in sound bar. That's, like, that's, that's a very Dragon Ball uh, <laughs> like, way of thinking. I I would like I would like I, I think it would be really cool to like tie that in though because we like we don't see the Yardradians outside of what's in the mon what the super manga mm -hmm. and. Uh, the little bit that we knew from filler and that's that's it mm -hmm. um so i don't know but yeah so they were like they were like just trying to get answers from glorio 
Um, and that was like a real fast turnaround too. Uh, yeah. They 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 were just, like the conversation they had was extremely short. Um, they were like, oh, but how can we trust you? And it's like, and kind of back and forth. And it's like, okay, I'll go. And then Shin was like, was like, okay, I'll go too. And then while he was going to prep the ship, he was like, oh, we got to be wary because we don't know where he got this. We don't know how he knows that we turn into children and yeah. all, all this other stuff. Um, and then Vegeta wanted to go along too, and they were like, they were like, no, it can only fit three people. <laughs> and Vegeta, and Vegeta's like, we're smaller now, so it can fit more. <laughs> <laughs> but he has to wait for Bulma. No, he has to wait. For, he has to wait for Bulma. Um, and then they, and then they kind of like, and then they, and then again, they allude to how smart Bulma is too. Because she comes out and she's like, "Oh, before you go, like, can I take a look at your ship? Might be able to speed up the process of the ship, other ship I'm working on." And she looks at it for like five seconds and is like, "Yep, that's that's, that's all I needed." Pointed a flashlight under it real quick. And like, oh, okay. Oh, uh, okay. It's like I figured it out. Now I can get this done faster. It's like how? <laughs> Where are you getting the tech? <laughs> she is wait. She's like I I. I have, I mean, I think without Bulma, I think the entirety of like Dragon Ball would actually like fall apart. I don't think we would even have Dragon Ball if it wasn't for Bulma. <laughs> you wouldn't have a Dragon Radar. You wouldn't have a time machine. You wouldn't have spaceship to get the Namek. You wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have all the money that she's been giving all the Z fighters over the years to kind of facilitate yeah. tournaments and <laughs> and and stuff. Like Bulma, Bulma's the goat. She's the goat. It's a, she's pretty cool. But and then that wrapped up and it went into the closing credits. Uh, what you what you take from the closing credits songs and stuff? I didn't actually watch the closing credits song. Ah, okay. Um, but the only I only there's only two things that I got, and it's that like there's a couple of post a lot of the scenes from like this closing credits. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of like still images that were very reminiscent of a lot of still images from the opening and closer and closers of GT too. Like, mm -hmm. I remember there was one scene and there was one scene where like all of the characters in Daima are like sitting around a riverbed and they're like all playing in the water and fishing and all in, mm -hmm. and all this and that. And like the spaceship to, for, to the demon realms in the background. And there's one credit scene in GT where, uh, where it's the exact same thing. Like Goku's like butt naked with his, with his rear to the camera uh, Trunks and Pan and Giru are all hanging out by a riverbed. The spaceship in GT is there as yep. well. So there was there was some there was some cool tie-ins to GT, which I think definitely give. I think seeing a lot of these like references to GT, I think definitely makes me think that this is a lot more GT coded than I than we initially thought. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of denying of like, oh, this isn't GT 2.0. Like it can't, like I like it's not going to be. But I think I think it's possible that uh, Toriyama probably took some inspiration from GT for this particular story. I mean, just turning the kids or the Z fighters into kids using the Dragon Balls is pretty GT. Yeah, but I, I, me, and I think a lot of others were trying to like avoid that fact. We were thinking like, okay, maybe he has a different idea for why he is doing this. Which, to be fair, he did. They treated they treated the turning into children idea bet he treated the turning into children better idea better than what GT did with Goku. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's better. But um, I wanted to avoid the idea that like, oh, he's doing this to like remake GT. You know, like it's not it, like this isn't. Well, I think it's more odes to it than it is like yeah. remake GT. Um, and then the final shot. Um. The final shot of the closing credits too was um was another ode to Toriyama. Um mm -hmm. it's it's Daima Goku looking up into the sky, seeing a bird pass by him, and he looks up and the bird's glowing white and flapping mm -hmm. away, going into like a into like a sunset. And it yeah. just and it like it flaps away and then like like disappears. Like it fade it fades out into a, into like a blinding uh light. And that's specifically that is a uh i think i think that's meant to be a final send off unless there's going to be more toriyama references within the series which there could be um i think that's going to be a send off it's a send off for toriyama because it's in reference to uh his bird studio 
Yeah. Um, which is his, which is his, uh, his, uh, writing studio, his publication studio. So, um, so I thought that was, that was a really nice ode to him as well. Um, but that does it for Dima episode two. What were your overall thoughts? Overall, I thought it was a good episode. I mean, it's only episode two. So, um, I think we, we laid a little more foundation, learned a little more about the demon realm and, um, some other characters and whatnot. So I'm um, excited to see what the next episode makes. Maybe we'll get a little more action in there. Or, yeah, I I like to see what the combat is going to look like in it. Yeah. Um, just going off of that scene where Goku gets the power pull back and he starts doing like the spins with like the spins and moves yeah. with it. Like that has me excited to see what combat's going to kind of look like. Yeah, uh, gonna be really cool. The animation was very crisp for that, so I hope that mm-hmm. that transitions well. Mm-hmm. Um, now. Before we end, I do have one theory. Let's hear it. And it could be outlandish to think. But at the but same... It, but this, it, is, this, is, this is a theory you've been talking about. I have not heard this theory. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, we know, so there's a couple things that obviously Daima's introduced, reintroduced to us. We found out about the demon realm. We know about demons. We found out that most most entities with pointy ears can have ties, could have ties to the demon realm. Yeah. And so I was having a, there's been a lot of discussion over the years, not just now, but like over the years, there's been a lot of discussion about like, um, we know that like, we know that Toriyama brought Broly into Canon. Mm-hmm. And so there's been lots of talks over the years about like, oh, what, who, what's the next thing from the Z movies and stuff that's going to be made into canon? Everyone's talking like how Cooler should be reintroduced into canon, yeah. um, which Cooler would be pretty cool to see come into canon. Uh, Frieza having a brother and then we just never see him like like because I, th- I think he's made reference to Cooler, right? Frieza made reference to Cooler once i think just like about having a brother i think yeah i don't i don't like not not anything by name or anything but i I feel like there might have been an allusion to it um but it actually got me thinking that you know this is akira toriyama's last like that we know of is his last like hurrah with the franchise unless there's some movie down the line that's coming out we know there's a movie like in the works we just don't know what it is Mm -hmm. um so i went through I went through like some of the like archives. I went through like yeah. I went through like the Dragon Ball wiki and was looking at like all the different like villains that could be introduced um into it. And I have a couple ideas. I don't th- I, but I think one would be a lot more a lot cooler to see than the other ones. Mm-hmm. But what if Daima is going to reintroduce Janemba? Because he is a demon, right? So I went and looked up his wiki page. Um, and his wiki page, um, they talk about how he was, br- in, in the movie, he was in Fusion Reborn, he was birthed by the overloaded a soul cleansing machine in Otherworld. But he is yeah. specifically mentioned to be a powerful demon wielding reality distorting powers and the living definition of evil. That'd be a... Uh, so, um, so, and like, I was so like, um, let me just kind of go down through like, like what, like his, like some, like the biography and stuff like that. Uh, so like his name, <clears throat> his name is likely a pun of Janai Me Pas, which means I don't like in French. And the way it's spelled means evil thought wave. Um, then... He's got by his design, he has like devil, he has devil like horns, but he also has pointy ears as well. So the so the ears can kind of like allude to it in a way. Um, he's got in terms of appearance, um, in the movie, he took over the psyche demon, which was which, I don't know if you remember seeing that movie at all, but he was like, he was like. <laughs> He, he he was a horn demon like the ogres mm-hmm. um but like and he was like wearing like headphones and he was like jamming out and like that's what caused like the the whole thing um uh, he possesses that 
but I don't I don't think you could allude to that um in that particular instance. Um they talk he they talk about he has four holes on his belly. And we know that the Takayami or whatever in the demon realm, like they have the Dragon Balls like in their stomachs. Or like or whatever. So like maybe there's an allusion to like the holes on his stomach. Um And then he's got like, and then like he's got yellow eyes. So it's so like, not nothing else that I can think of has like yellow eyes. I think like the the Yardradians have yellow eyes. I think, based off of their designs. Mm-hmm. Um. And then in terms of, I mean his, I mean in terms of personality, they say he's like they say he's like a destructive, aggressive monster, uh, with little motivation other than sadistic pleasure and lust for anarchy. Um, he's capable of using his power to alter the reality to his liking with no regard for how it affects others, uh, showing an obsessive need to control. So as far as we know, based off of what we've been told of the demon realm so far, if we want to go into the whole, uh, oppression of like Majin and demons in the realms and why people were like leaving, uh, the demon realm, like that seems like in terms of motivation, that's pretty in line with what a ruler of the demon realm would kind of do. Like mm-hmm. maybe Goma's not the big bad. Maybe he's just like facilitating for the big bad. Yeah. That it's, would be really cool. I'd actually like that a lot. If they brought him in there for something like that. Um, yeah. Cannon. Yeah. Um, something about if he insults his magic, if someone, it's a little stupid, but if someone insults his magic, it becomes slightly weaker for a while and cracks. <laughs> uh, proving that his powers are deeply connected with his emotional state and that he is easily offended, which can be used during battle to unbalance him for a short period, though not enough to prove decisive. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily want that translated into it. If, if they brought that on, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of like dumb up. Uh, that's like up there with like, Oh, uh, Broly was mad at Kakarot because he cried in the crib next to him. Yeah. Like kind of, kind of <laughs> dumb, but I mean, I I mean, I think there's some credence to it personally. Like, I don't I don't expect this because I don't want to set myself up for yeah. disappointment. But we know that Toriyama is not a, a Toriyama's not like afraid to like canonize like stuff from Z, um, yeah. proven by Broly. So I I would actually like it if like they made some someone like Janemba canon and like bring him into that whole thing i think that'd be really awesome that'd be pretty cool because i can't imagine that like goma like goma D- yeah, and degesu they, they don't they don't they don't seem like fighters to me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so i can't imagine that they're they're like, the actual big bad like he's more of like a bobbity kind of thing yeah kind of character to, to facilitate who the big bad really is yeah that's that's just me though um I also I, I think that'd be really cool. I've had I've had other thoughts too, like Garlic Jr. would be a would be another thought. Mm-hmm. Um because he's pointy eared as well. So like he like they could make him into canon. Um but I don't think Garlic Jr. Jr. is as hype as Janemba. So like oh. I can't imagine that I mean in terms of des- design philosophy, I think I think Garlic Jr. probably fits the aesthetic better than Janemba does. Yeah. Um, but I feel like if they wanted to, I feel like if they wanted to canonize Garlic Jr. in this, in this series, they would have done it in like Goma's place. Doesn't Pilaf have pointy ears? Pilaf does have pointy ears. And as far as we, in terms of what we know of him, in terms of his race, like he's, I think he's referred to as an imp. Mm-hmm. So I mean, yeah, I mean, he could be from the demon realm. <laughs> as as far as we know, like he's got pointy ears, so he must, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. um, yeah, that's that's a good question too. I mean, Garlic Junior basically is just Pilaf, but for the movies. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't know. I I I yeah. I think like Gar- like I said, Garlic Junior stands out to me. Um. And like a lot of like Garlic Jr.'s henchmen have pointy ears too, so you could probably make that argument that they're from the Demon Realm too, if they were if they were canon. Um, but Garlic Jr. to me just isn't hype enough 
for a series like this. I think I would much rather see Janemba be brought into canon rather than Garlic Jr. Oh, yeah, I think most people would. Um, but yeah, that was episode two. Mm-hmm. Um, do we want to give like these ratings? Do we want to do like a rating system for for like these episodes, like in terms of it, overall thoughts? I, I think it's a good idea. I think maybe because we're only two episodes in. Yeah, I think kind of a rating at this point would like maybe maybe like next episode and or the episode after that. Kind I of think of yeah, I think. I, I kind of want to give my ratings ju- uh, now just to kind of give, give people an idea of what I thought. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so like episode one, I think I would probably give, I think I'd give an eight. Um, the first episode was very compelling. There was a lot that was thrown at us in terms of world building and stuff like that. Um, in terms of like a first episode, I think it was perfect in that sense. Mm-hmm. But, um, but obviously, like, I want to see, like, more uh, in order to really, like, solidify uh, how I feel about, like, the series as a whole. But I think eight's a strong way to start the series, I think. Like, obviously, obviously, the, the I think the big reason why it's an eight right now is just due to the fact that uh, we have the whole, the unfusing of Shin and stuff like that um being a bit of a retcon until we are until that's maybe rectified later. So I would give it an eight just mainly because of that. Um and then this episode I'd probably give like a seven. Like it's like it doesn't steer too far away from what the first episode did. Um but it was like a lot of just sitting around um a little more world building um but more sitting around compared to the first episode. Um it didn't really like do anything to like stand out for me personally. But yeah, um, that's where I kind of stand with it. Episode one, eight. Episode two, seven. Yeah, I'm gonna wait to give my ratings yeah. just because it's too early yet for me okay. uh, to make kind of any. That's fair. Be, just my way of thinking is, I can think of an episode right now that's only and give it a rating, but maybe the next episode builds on that episode, and then that kind of bumps up that episode. Yeah, that's just how I I look at it. But yeah, my my think, rating is not like a in set in stone. It's more so just yeah. like. I, I'm using it as like a guideline to like mm-hmm. to like rate the the overall. So like uh, as stuff gets revealed and stuff gets uh introduced or rectified, like it, it'll obviously adjust my scores a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I think it is important just to I think it is somewhat important to like have that have like a rating go as you go, just because you gotta you gotta hold it to some semblance of standard after yeah. <laughs> after su- how super started with like it's terrible and like if, if we did this with super as it was airing uh like i would have given like the first couple episodes of super like fours and fives <laughs> <laughs> just for the animation alone <laughs> so, um but yeah i i think it's important for to keep standards and th- me that's just me personally but for you not wanting to give a rating like it's understandable i get i get it yeah, a couple more episodes, and I should uh, have a good idea. All right. Well, any final thoughts before we end it? Just excited to see where it goes. Uh, excited to see more Fusion Wool cards come out. I'm kind of itching to get my hands on some boxes. Um, continuing playing Spark and Zero. It's fun. Love Spark and Zero. Can't. No complaints well, still. I wonder when more DLC will drop for that. So DLC, I think, wow. DLC, I think, uh, starts at the beginning of the year. Okay. Uh, quarter one, we'll get superhero stuff. Uh, quarter two, we're gonna get the first iteration of Diamond DLC, and then quarter three, we're getting the second iteration of Diamond DLC. Um, and supposedly there's a fourth one that was that was found in leaks, but we don't know what that alludes to. So. I thought that I thought I saw something about that being granola. Like he was in the files. No, I don't. I, if he is, that would be awesome. But I don't. I don't think anything from the manga is being introduced until it's actually animated. But we'll we'll see. I think I think it might be more OG Dragon Ball, maybe. That'd be cool. Um. But all right. Well, that's going to do it, I guess, for episode two. So yeah. you you want to send us off? 
No, you go ahead. I sent, I brought us in. Okay. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for episode two of Kamea Radio. We talked about, obviously, Dima episode two and some Fusion World today. We'll see what we end up talking about alongside episode three next week. But thank you guys so much for listening in. Uh, we will be, we're working to get the podcast up on iTunes and Spotify as well. So, um, if those are your preferred listening, uh, apps of choice, we are working to get that up, but we, we need, we got to get over some hurdles before we can do that. So, um, but until, yeah. but until then, uh, if you guys are enjoying the podcast, please consider, uh, letting us know, we'll hit that subscribe button on the channel to just stay in, stay informed of when the next episodes do go live. And then, uh, That'll do it. So thank you guys so much for uh, coming and listening with us. And we hope you guys are enjoying Dima as much as we are. So thank you guys. We'll see you guys all in the next one. Bye.